I'm James Hahn II, and you're listening to the Oil & Gas This Week podcast, brought to you by Red Wing. This is episode 51.5.1.5 episodes are my chance to speak with entrepreneurs, executives, and thought leaders from inside and outside the industry, to hear their stories, what inspires their work, what culture drives their company, what innovations they're bringing to the oil field. My guest today is Neil Wen. Neil is an oil and gas Lean Six Sigma expert and founder of the Hill Growth Fund. He founded the fund in order to purchase a small to medium-sized enterprise within the oil industry. That may sound like a lofty goal for a 29-year-old young professional, but Neil Wen is no ordinary 29-year-old. He played football at the United States Air Force Academy and eventually served our country in the United States Air Force as a captain where he was a communications officer and Six Sigma black belt. After returning to civilian life, Neil brought his skills to the private sector and spent six years at GE Oil & Gas practicing as a lean Six Sigma black belt. Neil Went, welcome to Oil & Gas this week. Can I get a t-shirt like .5 crew or you know, .5 club, something like that? <laughs> Yeah. yeah, you know we should create some point five swag for our, for our point five guests. I want That's some a good swag idea. here. Now, does this disqualify me from the the baggage runoff? Am I, it, it, no, no, you're not an employee of Tribe Rocket, okay. nor Modal Point, nor Red Wing. So you're saying there's a chance? <laughs> there is a chance. There is a chance, <laughs> and the chance that I want today is to get into Six Sigma, Lean Six Sigma, and your story. And it's fascinating to me because you are what twenty nine. Yeah, twenty nine. You've you've lived you've lived quite a life for a twenty nine <laughs> year old, and just take us from the beginning. Where did you start? Where are you from? Yeah, so uh, actually born and raised in Austin, Texas. So uh, Texas boy, tried and true. Um, played football in high school like every everybody does. Um, got a, uh, recruited to play football at the Air Force Academy. So I was actually a free safety for my first two years at the Air Force Academy up in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Um, Free know, safety. Yeah. So I was a guy in the back. Wasn't always the fastest, but I just kind of knew where the ball was going. Did, did you did you launch on some people? Every oh, yeah. I mean, that was the fun part. That was, <laughs> that was like the only thing I was actually good at is hitting people. So um, It's always the white guy back there, right? Yeah. You know, just the only one white guy. Ball <laughs> hawking, man. I, I, was, I was that guy. Uh, funny story is, um, actually, the guy we met, Mark. I met Mark LaCour through a guy named Bobby Giannini, and Bobby was the starting free safety my freshman year. We were both freshmen, so he was the starting free safety, and I mean, we hated each other. We used to go at it in practice. I mean, get after it, and so now we're like best friends. <laughs> so we actually, you know, uh, he was a ROTC instructor down at the University of Texas in Austin, and really close family friend. My, you know, my whole family loves him, and so Bobby actually introduced Mark and I together. And you said ROTC. What is that? ROTC. Uh, so Reserve Officer Training Corps. So if you uh, ever been to, you know, they have JR ROTC, so Junior ROTC, which is in high school, and then Reserve Officer Training Corps is another path besides the Air Force Academy, or any academy, really, um, of which you can be an, uh, an officer. So if you've ever been on a university campus and seen, you know, these guys marching in uniforms, 99% of the time, they're actually ROTC members, so Reserve Officer Training Corps. Those are the guys that are trying to recruit me? Yeah. <laughs> well, I can't speak for everything, because, you know, there's much, but more than likely, yeah, that was probably them. Up in uh, Michigan State? It, well, it was, it, well, it was in Northern Michigan. Okay. And my point to every recruiter was I didn't want to go to war. And their point was always, oh, yeah. well, it's peacetime. And I said, how long do you think that's going to last? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, I remember this. So, yeah, that was back in... Uh, 98. 98, yeah, the late 90s. So, I mean... Hey, yeah. man, it's peacetime. Come on in. I, no, no, I, I read a history book. Yeah, I, you know, I don't want to say kudos for calling that, but, you know, you got it right, which, <laughs> unfortunately, but... Unfortunately, but yeah. it, it's just history, and, but, but God bless y'all for, for going out there and doing what, what small men like myself who no, would, would no, be crumbled. No. Crumbled. <laughs> no, it's, I mean, to be honest, I went and played football for the Air Force Academy. Um, I blew out my knee after two years of playing, to, um, became a recruiting coordinator after that. So I was actually the lead uh, Division One recruiting coordinator for the largest Division One football program in all the nation. Um, liked what and I what heard. What program is that? The Air Force Academy, okay. Air Force football. So Fighting Falcons, go Falcons! Right? Oh wow! Yeah. So the, the difference is like University of Texas, Texas A and M, University of Houston. Generally speaking, they're recruiting about forty to fifty kids. Right? They know who they want. Those kids kind of want to go to Texas. 
Air Force Academy is a little different, right? It's a national school, but we also have that military commitment, the five-year military commitment afterwards. So you know how hard it is to talk to a 17-year-old kid about playing college football than serving five years in the military? So because <laughs> of that, you know, we have to have the largest uh, uh, recruiting program. So we actually actively recruited up to 650 uh, high school students, high school football players every year. So it was, a, you know, it was a pretty big operation. How, how do you even scout 650 <laughs> people? That's, that's if you're 365 days a year. Oh man, it's it's intense. And I tell you what, it's a lot of film. I mean, I don't, I roar out some some rewind buttons, but it's a lot of film. Um, it's a lot of we get a lot of help from the community too. So it's not it's necessarily you know like we're this unnamed, unheard of school. So there's a lot of principals who want to see their students go there. There's a lot of communities that want to see their kids go there. So we get that kind of help, but you know, it's football camps and, and it's just, you know, it's a numbers game, you know, <laughs> just like anything else, it's a numbers game. So I really, um, that's where I really started to take off and understand that, you know, I could actually speak in front of people and, <laughs> and efficiencies because it was so, such a big thing. You had to really focus in on your time, but I absolutely love doing it during the football games and, you know, speaking to the parents and talking to them about the future. And, and you know, the phrase I used to always love is, I went through four. I'm going through four years of hell for 40 years of freedom. You know, when I get out of here, the world's my oyster kind of thing. And who's going to stop me? You know, just kind of the motivation and that when you go through that stuff, man, it's it's really what you want to commit towards and move towards long term. So I, I obviously they teach you a lot of discipline in the military, and the Lean Six Sigma is a very disciplined approach to business. <laughs> yeah, where where did that come into play? Yeah, so after I graduated in uh, May 2008, um, I was actually stationed, my first duty station was at RAF Crowton in the United Kingdom, so I actually lived in Oxford, England. Three years, it was amazing. You I, lived in Oxford, England for three years? Yeah, I lived in the city center, uh, you know, that's my town, I absolutely love it, the, the Turf Tavern, um, uh, you know. All the pubs out there. Oh man, I, I got them all down, I had it down when people come and visit, you know, the Eagle and Child out there, and then um, a lot of my friends actually were Air, uh, Academy, so West Point, Naval Academy, Air Force Academy who'd receive road scholarships or holiday scholarships. So, yeah, you know, it was a, it was a lot of fun. I, I, you know, it actually, in the real formidable years of developing who you are, and it changed a lot, actually. It's, you know, I still notice some of my habits I have because I lived right in the middle of downtown, which I do now in Houston. But uh, uh, Sort of a different downtown. A little bit. Just a little bit. <laughs> kind of different accent. Yeah, <laughs> just a little bit. Much better food. Yeah, I, I will tell you, yeah. No, it was great. So I used to always have friends who come visit me. They're like, you don't like the food? I'm like, no. They're like, oh, I loved it. I was like, you were here for a week and a half. Like, I've been here for two and a half years. Like, you get tired of fish and chips after a while. Yeah, fish and chips and what pie. And <laughs> oh, yeah, no, yeah. But good, hey, a good kidney pie or a good uh, uh, pasty, you know. it's Blood sausage. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> to, that, be, to that's... be fair, like, the good stuff is actually pretty good. So... You know, on the flip side, where you get tired of eating it day after day, I can't eat it over here because I actually had the, you know, really good fish and chips, the, the mushy peas. It, you know, so it's, it's just weird where you're like, I hated the food. No, but I know that feeling because I'm from Detroit, Michigan. The largest Arab population in the world outside of the Middle East lives yeah. in Dearborn, okay. which is a suburb of Detroit. And that's why I love Houston so much, because it's the first place outside of southeast Michigan that I've found decent shawarma. <laughs> that's you, you know you bring up a good point is you know when i talk to people about houston and they go what do you think of houston i'm like i love it man yeah it gets humid but the food here is unlike anything else and you know people always assume it's like barbecue or mexican i mean you name any every type of, culture in any the world type is of here cuisine you want and we're gonna find good good food so well let's get back on yeah. track so <laughs> and we digress <laughs> and we digress let's get back on track though because um you you so you're in oxford and at what point and and what t- what was it was it a class? They, 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 they said, hey, go and do this thing? How did you get involved? Yeah, it's actually pretty funny. So within the first, you know, four or five months of being stationed out there, I got ball and told, and that's, you know, fairly common trait in the military. Hey, go do this. And they said, hey, go do this, you know, AFSO 21 Greenbelt course. It's been a week out there, and it's the Greenbelt equivalent for the Air Force. So the Lean Six Sigma program in the Air Force is called AFSO 21, Air Force Smart Operations for the 21st Century. And they said, go do this class. So I went over there for a week, sweet week TDY, a temporary duty. And um, it just clicked, you know, <laughs> it's like love at first sight, right? It's like, oh my gosh, this is exactly how I think, you know, they had a phrase. So that, you're very systematic in your thinking by nature. Oh, definitely. And, and the phrase that, you know, kind of sums it up the most is one of they kept giving us in basic training is, you know, 
work smarter, not harder, you know, and that, that just always made sense to me because I will always meet your expectations. Because once I meet them, I'm going to go do something else. If you, if you don't like it, raise your expectations. I'm going to meet those and then go do something else. So, you know, it just kind of clicked. And I said, all right, well, this is what I like to do. You know, so I, I just really didn't take no for an answer for after that. So I went back and said, okay, I've had my Greenbelt certification. So I want to get, the, you know, get. But, but let me let me stop you there, though, because yeah. you're, you're living in Oxford. You get your Greenbelt certification. Is that right? Yep. And at that point, what does that mean? Yeah, exactly. So what's behind the curtain on that? So, uh, you know, went to class and then there's, you have to run projects. So, you, you know, Greenbelt, and I'll, I'll say this again and again and again, and I say this when I teach these courses to, you know, in, in companies and then in, at universities is there's a lot of things out there where the certification really does matter. You know, I want my doctor to have these certifications. I want my dentist, my, you know, I want all those people to have their certifications. In Lean Six Sigma, you know, the proof is in what you know. And it's good to have a certification, but it's what you've done and what you've experienced and how you can articulate. Results. It's, it, it, yeah. It, it, what, not necessarily about results, because you can do a project and fail, but you know in what you've taken away from that project and what you've learned from that, right? The, you know, if, if I can really, I can tell right off the bat if you've done real world projects, right? In, so, but but I'm, still, I'm still struggling because I'm, I'm looking for what what are those kernels of wisdom that are in the green belt? Because obviously we're going to work our way up to black. Yep, black so, belt. So and master black belt. That's actually okay. That's actually how it goes. All right. So then, what what are one or two of the things that are in the green belt that really make a difference? Yeah, it's honestly it's an introduction into a way of thinking, and it's forcing you to go through some of those projects, understand what is the problem, defining the problem is the key. Can you give us an example of a project? Yeah. So uh, you know I. Great question. Uh, right off the top of my head is we don't have a truck to take these to get coded at the coding place. You know, so th that's, that's where people always say we don't have a truck. Well, that's a solution, right? So what you want to do is to take a step back and say, no, what's the actual problem? Well, the problem is these widgets are not getting coded fast enough. We, we waste two weeks on the coding. So the key thing is you take a step back. Are you saying coding like paint? coding paint or you know i'm just trying to i'm hearing the word code and oh no <laughs> yeah no we're over here hacking no no like paint or you know protective coating you know something like that so if it's really teaching you to get in the habit of taking that step back and defining the problem and not putting solutions actually into your problem i mean the greenbelt projects actually run the gamut it really is it's not just necessarily manufacturing and it's not just necessarily making something it could be you writing emails like something that simple could be a Greenbelt project where you look, get to look at templates or standard of works and understanding where the wastes are coming in. The, the, everybody, Lean Six Sigma, Lean actually got it from um, Toyota, and Six Sigma is actually from Motorola, and then GE actually made Lean Six Sigma, you know, the staple that it is. And so uh, these are all manufacturing-based environments. But Lean and Lean Six Sigma especially as a whole isn't just manufacturing. You can, def you can do it in so many different aspects. You can do... There's a course in, in the University of Tennessee, and I know some of my training got it, but um, business process reengineering, where it's just looking at administration process. And it's, you know, it's anything that you have a problem. So what you want to look at is where do you waste time? Like, where do you repeat yourself? So where do you do the same thing over and over again, right? So where do you, um, where do you need a standard of work or a template, right? Or checklist, the book, you know, I have a list of books I'd recommend, but Checklist Manifesto, I absolutely love that book. Let's, um, let's, let's definitely keep that in yeah, mind, we'll, we'll, and we'll put all of the links in the show notes to the books you recommend. Oh yeah, definitely. That would be awesome. Yeah, but... but, give but, me, but let me, I'm going to jump in yeah. here, though, because you kept going, so I assume you excelled. So what yeah. was the first project with that you, the, the first problem you identified in the Air Force where you said, hey, here's a problem. I'm going to go and, and, and solve it. Man, we're going to go way back. So I didn't say I don't remember. I, the Air Force does an eight-step problem-solving method. It's, again, just like the DMAIC or define, measure, analyze, improve, and control. It's very, very similar. It's just these two steps go here, these two steps go here. But honestly, a lot of my projects were focused on quality of life aspects. So, you know, I had, I had some of my airmen stay until 6, 7 p.m. when – you know, they're supposed to hit, and they're not, they're not hitting PT at any time during the week. So we're like, okay, you know. PT? Physical training. Yep. <laughs> right? So, you know, the mission of the Air Force is not to make money, right? It's to put bombs on bad guys. That's what we do in the Air Force. So you really focus a lot on quality of life aspects. And, and you know, how do we get this job, how do we get the mission done in the amount of time we need? And then you can still go hit PT because physical fitness, fit to fight, that's actually part of the job requirement, which, you know, I absolutely love. 
but mission comes first, right? People come first, but mission. You've got to get the mission done. So a lot of stuff we did was, why is this job taking us to 6 p.m.? Why is this job taking us to 9 p.m.? Why are we you know, working our people 12 hours a day every day? And, you know, and we were, a couple of them were 24-hour shops and stuff. But why can we not do what our mission is? And that's fit the fight and get the mission done. So we really focused on where are we putting in defects? Where are we recreating the wheel? Where are we, you know, there's a simple one that I'll never forget. It was actually one of the first ones that actually, you know, that, that light bulb came on in my head is there was these, these contract agreements. We were at a foreign, we were in a foreign nation, so we had to get contract uh, approval with the UK government, and we had to work on that. And these contracts were taking 24 months, you know, and they're supposed to be slotted for six months, right? And this is a Word document where 10 different units have to get involved and in, in, in sign off on stuff and stuff like that. So they were like, no, no, we're, we're good. We're, you know, 70%. There's a couple stragglers. And then we started mapping them out. And we're like, okay, let's look at the data. What does the data tell us? Well, the last 30 contracts that we've had to do, the average is 21 months, right? The longest one was 36 months or something, something insane. And it like, was supposed to take six? Six. It was, all parties agreed on six. And it, to be honest, it's, it wasn't even that complicated. So it was... It was and and you, so, so you d- identified who, where the broken links in the chain were. Exactly. So the first thing is, what is a defect, right? Defining what that defect is. And this was obvious. We're like, okay, well... What was the defect in that case? Well, no, the defect was, it's supposed to take six months. And it was taking, you know, average in 21. Okay. So we're not hitting the six months. That's the problem. That's the problem. Right. So then you look and say, okay, what are some contributors to the problem? So, you know, it would go, you know, it, it, you'd be on email. And I love email. It's a great tool. People can rely on it a little bit too much, right? So I send you this email. I wait a week. You had a question. You send it back. Guess what happens when we do this interaction? I've got other things I'm thinking about, Right. This is not the most important thing to do. How many people sit in front of their email and they're ready to just fire off a response immediately? It just doesn't happen. There's other priorities and life just gets in the way. So this is what was happening. And then guess what? We'd send it to your inbox, but you had PCS or moved to another position, right? Okay. Then I send it to another person. Guess what? They're on leave. So right? did you end up taking it out of email and into a proprietary system? No. Actually, this is the greatest thing is, is, is everybody, you know, when you look at automating stuff, everybody thinks there's this fancy, you know, $50,000, $100,000 um, solution. Sometimes it really is simple. You know, they keep it simple, stu- uh, stupid, or what is it, Oxum's Razor, the simplest solution is always the best, right? So literally what we did was we got all parties involved. First of all, it was enlightening to say all parties involved, okay, this is our average. No, that's not right. Okay, where did we mess up? Look at all these, you know, look at, this is the start date. We all agreed upon it. This is a completion Here's date. Here's the data. Yeah, exactly. Tell me what's wrong. Okay, fine. Okay, that, you know, I'm not trying to point fingers. This is where we're at. This is our problem. We have to get under six months. How do we do it? So we took this thing that was taking 21 months to get through, and we created this um, standard of work, something we did every single time. And what we would do is we would set up a lunch two, three weeks out, and you know, you'd invite all parties and you'd specifically say, bring someone who can make decisions for your organization. So we go, okay, we put it on a projector screen. We'd write the thing in less than an hour. Everybody's in the room. They put their inputs. Do we all agree? Yeah. Lock it down, PDF, send it out. This is it. And it sure, sure, sure as I'm standing here, you know, we'd get it back a week or two weeks later. Well, this guy didn't know what he was talking about. This, this lady had no right to do that. So this is wrong. No, and we had full support of the leadership, and this is part of the green belt, part of the lean six sigma, part of that process. Is, it's a top down buy in. Yeah, you you have to have it. You you cannot be the process and the whip, right? You can't be the carrot and the stick. That just can't happen. You have to have top down buy in, and the, so once you have top down buy in, the colonel goes, the general goes, no, no, this is what you agreed to. You sent somebody who can make decisions. This is it. So guess what happened next time? promise you somebody who can make decisions was in on that meeting so we took this thing that was 21 months and it was i mean this was painful like this was causing a lot of egos involved too it's not just egos but it's you know why can't they do their job they should know better that's so simple what who are these so it's not even just egos it's just why can't they do their job and you're like well let's figure out why they can't let's go over there and ask them and you know half of it is Oh, I thought you wanted it this way. Oh, I thought you wanted it this way. Well, that one time two years ago, now that's been a law. I can't tell you how many times I've heard doing this over the last six years, or actually nine years, six years in total, right? I cannot tell you how many times I've heard you say, heard somebody say, no, it's the law, or it's an Air Force instruction, or no, it's the law, or 
This is I a- can't change it. It's <laughs> not. It, it, this is API. I only work here. Yeah, this is API. No, 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 no. The CEO of the company says it has to happen this way. Okay, let's go ask him. Let's go ask her. Right? Let's go find out. No, no, no. You don't understand. This is an API requirement. Okay, show me the requirement. And I'm not trying to be rude. I'm just saying, hey, if it's a law, I want to know the law to the T. So with when requirement. And what happens? One time, two years ago, somebody changed it one time, and then it became this staple. It's we've always done it that way, and it's it's really the whole point of when you know we try to get in to do these facilitations, and we try to get in to teach these green belt courses in any environment. And I guarantee this is any company. It's teaching people to ask why, right? Why are we doing this way? It's not like you know ask the man, but it's understanding what the end state. You put the customer first, right? So that's actually what. The two things that Lean and Six Sigma have in common, do you know the definitions of both? Enlighten me. So Six Sigma is the statistical analysis to eliminate defects, right? So it's trying to make that perfect product. Lean is the elimination of waste. So it's trying to make that perfect process. However, what they both have in common is actually they have the customer in mind, right? And that's the key. And you always want to know what the customer is. There's a big phrase that we always say in um, Lean Six Sigma is what is the VOC? And, you know, I've, unfortunately I've said, hey, VOC before and I realized what it sounded like. I don't, I don't know what I did to save all that time, but VOC stands for voice of customer. See how much time I save by saying VOC? I'm such a cool guy. <laughs> no, but so it's, it's, it's understanding the voice of the customer. And that's the key thing. And, and a lot of this is, you know, looking at all these problems. And it's not just, you know, administrative process like the, the one we talked about, but it's also products in the field and well let me jump in on yeah. this um because you you had customers that you were dealing with that were internal customers air force customers mm-hmm. and well, you left the air force yeah. and and where did you go from there yeah so that's that actually helps me <laughs> let's tie this into oil and gas right so uh served my five years did a stint in afghanistan um and then came back and went to uh south carolina if anybody's ever been to something uh, south carolina it's you know the worst of the three england afghanistan and sumter south carolina <laughs> sorry for anybody out there from sumter but you oh, know they just they just got a starbucks in 2015 like i'm not trying to say it but i mean whew. so no i love south carolina it was a good time good food but um i took a job as a lean six sigma black belt for ge oil and gas so specifically at hydro and what they specialize is you know i'm sure most of these people know have dealt with a hydro but it's a blowout preventer sub deep water subsea blowout preventers so BOPs and, and, and the like. So where I actually started cutting my teeth in the manufacturing environment is with the mechanical controls components on the MUX pods. So I've actually got three product redesigns on on the MUX pods family, and that's because I went and understood what the voice of the customer was. MUX pods. Uh, multiplexing unit. Yeah. <laughs> Break it down. Yeah. So the MUX pod is actually, so if you picture the BOP as the, um, uh, the body, right, the bones of, of, of the... BOP, the MUX pod would be probably the spinal cord. So it's not, it's not the technical aspect. It's not receiving the signal, but it's opening and functioning and making everything work. So there's actually two on every uh, BOP we have. Requirement, blue pod, yellow pod. And the problem is, is that when that doesn't work, you have to have redundancy, especially in deep water subsea, especially with the current environment and the safety environment we're in now. So you have to pull it. If, the, if these valves, you know, don't work, you have to pull the pod. And guess what? Three days up, three days down. That's six days. It, you so what's your, what's your first day like when you're out there? You get hired into GE, and, yeah. and, and, and in Houston. Yep, in Houston. And and you you have the background and the expertise. Do you just have to go and start training? Yeah, it was. It's actually so part of the reason why I got the job was because I'd been a black belt in the Air Force. I actually ended up earning that certificate and. It's kind of funny. My first day, uh, my boss said, hey, welcome. Here's your desk. All right, I'm going to my new job. Wait, what? So he actually got a new job. So, it, you know, it's, it's one of the good things is, is I knew the lingo. So that Lean Six Sigma stuff, I kind of understood it. Just had to translate from eight-step problem-solving method to Demaic. But the key is understanding the process, understanding the product, understanding what we make. And so they're really the first six months was like, hey, what's that? Well, that's a shear so valve. Hey, what's that? Oh, well, that's an SPM valve. Hey, what's that? Well, that's also an SPM valve. Well, what's the difference? So, you know, so it's really just going out there to the point of use. They call it a gimba walk. It's, you know, gimba is, you know, where it's made. And so really it's just going out to the factory, you know, this, this you know, bearded new guy with long hair. I used to have, you know, the golden locks going. And, uh, yeah, I got out of the Air Force, man. I was growing it out. 
the golden boy over here. Yeah, exactly. Like, who's this new guy in slacks? What the, why do you keep asking questions? Like, who, why do you do that? Because that's the way we do it. How come? Because it's a law. I don't get out of here. So, it's, you know, it's really just going out there. And, you know, one of the things we also, you know, preach and preach and preach in these classes is you cannot solve a problem unless you see the problem. Like, you can't be <laughs> behind your desk and you can't be, you, you've got to get out there. You've got to know. And this is part of the reason why the, the certificates, yeah, they're good to have. But if I know for a fact you haven't ever been on the floor, you know, you know, um, doing a measurement system analysis. So it's M MSA. So part of the thing what we preach is if you haven't gone out on the shop floor, right, if you don't know the guy who's putting it together that he's got 20 years of experience and you go, yeah, you just go out there and tell him to fix it. Well, if you've never been out there and know how hard that actually is to get out there and talk to a guy who's been doing this for 20 years and you're some punk kid who, <laughs> who just got out of the Air Force and in slacks, if you don't know how hard that is, you're never going to get the problem solved, right? So you have to do that gimbal walk. You have to go to the place and see what the problem actually is because there's so many assumptions. We were doing a thing called a Shingi event, which is like a souped-up, lean Six Sigma event where it's a week and we dedicate time and, and energy to, to solving problems, right? And it's the whole, the whole plants get involved, right? I mean, it's huge. It's actually pretty impressive, but no one did any work ahead of time to record times. So we were trying to fix an annular, which is... The big annular and it's you know closes in on a pipe and stuff like that. So we were we were doing, how do we improve that time? Because we're averaging 250 days or something like that. And we need to get we need to get it down, or we were averaging more than that and we needed to get down to 120 or something. Some some big numbers get it down to a smaller number. <laughs> Sorry, I don't remember the specifics, but you know we we go okay. Well, how long does this take? Well, nobody had timed it, right? We hadn't filmed it. We hadn't solved it with real numbers, right? You need that real data. So we try to overcome this. And <laughs> I will never forget this. And I, I love saying this when I teach, but we got our two main guys down there. And these guys have been doing this for 30 years. I mean, they've been in this industry for 30 years, and they know the products forwards and backwards. And so, hey, how long does it take to, 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 to prep the annual? About two hours. All right, well, how, how long does it take to, to, to install the O-rings? About two hours. <laughs> All right, well, how long does it take to paint? About two hours. Now, how long does it take to prepaint? Ah, about two hours. <laughs> You're like, all right, well, I, I'm gonna go out on a limb and see. <laughs> I think putting the lid on that takes about two hours, right? Yeah, about two hours. <laughs> so you're like, all right, well, according to this thing, we get it done in 37 or 38 hours. We can build an annual. Oh no, you 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 just don't know. And these guys aren't bad guys. Now, they, please don't make. Please don't assume that I'm you know making fun of these. I love these guys. These are these are my guys. And I, but they're it, it's the same thing from my perspective on the marketing side of things within this industry, because marketing, sales, all of these things have have rapidly changed in the last decade with social media and digital marketing and everything like that. And there's even young guys in this industry who still fully believe that they need to be out there plus pressing the flesh and oh i don't i don't need to be doing you know xyz to attract customers to myself because that's just not how it's done and so i don't i don't really see it as you making fun of anyone i see it as recognizing it as a cultural issue in this industry absolutely but it, it all goes about to the point of you you cannot fix a problem unless you see the problem and you know it and you got to do it with real data because you know, one of the biggest things is this guy was right. It was taking about two hours. But you sit there and you, you start filming it or you start timing it. You go to the spot and you start hitting a stopwatch. And you're like, well, this thing was hanging up for an hour and 45 minutes. W what was going on? Like, why wasn't this lifted? And the actual action of installing an O-ring took three and a half minutes. What, where were we at for that hour and 45? Oh, well, they were testing. I don't understand how them testing affects us installing the O-ring. Oh, well, they were using the, the only crane we have in the place to lift it, to test it. Well, they have a test bed. Yeah, but they like to see underneath it to see if it's leaking. Okay, so you're telling me the only crane that we have to lift, this annular, is being tied up in testing because we don't prefer to use the test bed. So it's really like you start going upstream and you start asking why. You start doing the five whys. Why, why? You sound like a little kid. Why, 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 why? But when you start seeing that, you're like, oh, so that's the problem, right? So you, you start going, oh, okay, well, let's improve our test bed. So you go, wait, how's improving our test bed or fixing the access to the test bed speed up the rest of our process? But you'll never see stuff like that if you're not out on the shop floor, if you're not doing this stuff and asking the guys who make this stuff. I have to ask you, though, do people run when they see you coming on the shop floor? <laughs> uh, they, uh, <laughs> I definitely get, I get some comments. And, and you know, it's, it's kind of funny. And it, it, you... I really did tap into my military background and my military history and learn, learn how to get, get, 
get these guys motivated because, yeah, I'm not a nice guy because I'm going to annoy the heck out of some of these guys because I'm going to go, why do you do that? Why are we doing that? What about this? What about this? Well, let's do the standard. Why don't you do the same thing every time? And at the time, time you're, you're 25. It, no, at this time, like, yeah, so I started... Yeah, like 25, 26, 20, and they're going... Yeah, so I was... And, and I was they're, they're like, hey, buddy, I'm 55. Yeah, yeah. You know? So I, at the time, I, was, I just turned 27, I think. Yeah, so yeah, I, yeah. I was just at 27, and so, no, 20... Anyway, it was, I was, I was not like, old. They're like, yeah, this is cute yeah. and all, yeah. but why don't you go go ahead and, and, and go back to your cubicle there, <laughs> Johnny? Yeah, and a lot of these guys are like, no, I'll just wait them out. And, you know, it's where, you know, I'm stubborn. And, and you know what, let's do the same thing every single time. And... You know, it, I love those guys to death because some of the biggest proponents when you first get out there, and some of the guys give you the hardest time are going, this is never going to work. You don't know what you're doing. You don't know what you're talking about. I've been in this for 30 years. You know, you just keep plugging away. You keep asking why. You keep putting their problems first because you solve their problems, they make a better product. And I'm dumb enough to believe we can make a perfect product. But, you know, you just keep going out there. It's a war of attrition kind of thing. And at the end of it, man... They're hitting you up. They're calling you on your cell phone going, hey, man, we got a problem. We can fix it if we just do this, and we can just put this standard, and we need to... So they start it, to be able to connect the dots themselves. Oh, man, when that, you can see that light. You know, and I've been... I, you know, I've taught, I've taught the green belt class about 12 times in my career, once in Spanish. Yo puedo hablar español. Mm-hmm. That was the first time, I think you said. Yeah, yeah, so... Yeah, that was, Out of the gate. Yeah, right, so there... <laughs> we, uh, scheduling aspect happened, and, you know, one of our senior executives came down and goes... To my boss, hey, who speaks Spanish? Well, Neil speaks Spanish. And he's like, wait, you speak Spanish? Yeah. You want to go teach a Greenbelt class down in Veracruz, Mexico? Yeah. He goes, all right, cool, go. And I was like, was, <laughs> he laughed. I looked at my boss and go, what in the hell just happened? Ah! So, you know, luckily, um, you know, I'd had some training. I knew this stuff already, and I had a month and a half to prepare. So it actually worked out really great, and it, it, that, that plant down there was a lot of fun. A lot of ingenuity down there, but I've taught this class so many times, and I can see, you know, I'm going to snap into the, right? <laughs> I can see that moment where that light bulb just clicks in some of these guys. And these are guys who've been out there, and then they're the biggest naysayers. And you're like, look, this is common sense. Let me get out in front of you. Understand, if you do the same thing every single time, you get the same results. And, that, and that's really what you want to do, because all we want to do is make a perfect product, right? We want to eliminate defects. We want to eliminate waste, and we want to make a perfect product for the customer. One of the things that I struggle, have been struggling with as we've been talking about this is what does that look like? And it looks like you bothering the hell out of a bunch of people, <laughs> but then they're, they're, like you said, their light bulb going off. All of a sudden they're realizing this is real pain in my ass that I've been dealing with. And, and for it, Les Brown, if you ever heard of Les Brown, he's a, he's a legendary speaker, and he tells this story about this dog who, who sat on a nail, and he just sat there and he would moan throughout the day, and, and it was this old guy on the porch, and, and, and it was his dog, and someone came up and said, well, why, why is that dog moaning? He's sitting on a nail. <laughs> why doesn't he just move? I just got used to it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and it's kind of like maybe these guys, they just kind of got used to the problems and not even seeing that they actually are fighting an uphill battle. Yeah, no, and, and you... You're exactly right. I love that story, and I'm actually going to probably take that story and use that. I'll credit you and Les Brown. It's, so, it's all credit to Les Brown. Yeah, so we'll, we'll, I'll give you the shout-outs and, and, and credit where it's due, but it's exactly right, and you know, you just get used to something, and you do it that way, and, and that's why the, the most important principle when I taught the class, and when I teach the class, excuse me, when I teach the class is I want to get ingrained, learn to ask why. If you get nothing else from this class, nothing else from this podcast, is look at your job. Again, you know, where do you waste time? Where do you repeat yourself? Where do you need a standard of work? Where do errors come in, right? And you learn to ask why. Why are we doing it this way, right? Because, I mean, if you look at the principles of lean, and I got to admit that I'm actually more stronger suited in lean. Um, it's just how it shook out. Um, I, I can teach Six Sigma, and I do Six Sigma fine, but I actually like lean a lot better. So what are the principles of lean? Yeah, so the, the first principle, and these are, pel- you know, they build upon, not just pillars, but they build, you know, steps on this one. But you've got, the first one is you've got to define value in the eyes of your customer. So that's, What does that exactly mean? What this is the customer? such a yeah, sort so, of vague <laughs> phraseology. <laughs> right, so it's, you know, academia, but... It's defined value in the eyes of the customer. So it's not what the customer is asking for. It's not what the customer wants. It's solving your customer's problems. That's what it is, right? Sometimes in industries, customers actually know what their problems are. (laughs) Typically in the oil and gas industry, 
It's a little bit. So, but that's why you got to get collaborative, right? You got to understand what are the pain of the customer and then solve it. Because guess what? They're going to keep coming back. The so, sec- so once we define define the value in terms of the in terms of I'm I'm just okay. So I'm thinking off the top of my head. So I'm thinking, all right, we manufacture drill bits. Well, I got actually got a great story for this, and this okay. is why, you know I don't know if this was true, and but this is what I heard in my. Let's friend. run with it though. Yeah. But I've taught this, and I always lead it in with that exact phrase. I don't know if this is true, but it's a great story to serve a point, right? So this was actually done, the lean revolution was actually done for Starbucks in the mid-'90s. And they've got all their executives and the powers that be in the classrooms, and they're doing this. They're putting stickers on the wall. they got the white butcher paper going. And they needed to produce more faster. So the roasting amount of time for a coffee bean was three hours, right? That's a long time. So they were like... Time is money, time is money, time is money. So let's microwave the coffee bean. It gets it down to 30 minutes, right? We can, <laughs> let's do that. So they were going to mess with what the value. Why do people go to Starbucks? Because they like to spend $5 on a coffee? No, because it's the same every single time. The Starbucks here in Houston tastes the same as the Starbucks in Sri Lanka, the Starbucks in Dallas, Starbucks in Chicago. It always tastes the same. So, they were gonna, so is that the value then? That's the value in the customer's eyes. It's exactly right. So they were going to start messing with the, what the customer actually valued in the interest of time, right? So that's why you have to define value in the customer's eyes because then you've got to identify the value stream. That's the second principle, right? So they were saying, okay, well, this three-hour roasting, that's our value stream, untouchable. Until the entire time from pick to sip is three hours, we've got a lot of other stuff to work on, right? Because they started going, oh, wait, from the time I pick the bean in a fair trade country... <laughs> For the time our customer sips, it takes 30 days. So am I really going to mess with what our customers actually value in order to try to save two and a half hours when I can look in the whole entire chain and try to save 29 days and 21 hours, right? That's why you've got to establish a smooth, continuous flow because if there's any stops in that, that's exactly what you know, we talked about earlier where, hey, these widgets are not getting coded. Well, it stops it, right? There's not a fluidity of motion, right? So you want to have a smooth process because with smooth processes, there's no start and stops. It's not chaotic. It's fluid. And there's, everybody's just a little bit calm. just like Just like you were talking about the guys on the shop floor saying, well, th- there's the crane and this and that. That's exactly right. Well, then you start going, well, we, don't, we, we have to use this crane. Okay, well, let's start staging this. Let's start having smooth process. So there's no waiting, right? The one of the things I hate the most is waiting because it's just a waste. We could be doing something else, right? So that's why you want that. As they used to say in the kitchens, if you got time to lean, you got time to clean. Yeah, exactly. Something like that. So it's staggering. It's, it's looking at it. It's actually called staggering. It's, if you have a bottleneck or a theory of constraints, and I'm dropping some Great A knowledge on you right now. So theory of constraints, we'll get into that later on uh, future future podcasts and blogs, but that's deep down it. But when you have that, you want to maximize that so that everything's functioning on a continuous flow, right? The so, full, that, so that's two, or we three, already went through. That was three. three. That was so, three. Yeah, and we'll review them. <laughs> we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll take notes because we're going to review these after class. But uh, Yeah, well, um, I, I, I dropped out of college. So. <laughs> <laughs> but no, okay, so on to four. So four, four is, it's weird, but you want to pull the product. So... Instead of making it and pushing it onto your customer, making it and pushing on to the next step in the process, you want to wait for that next step to pull it from you. Now, this is really contrarian because you're like, no, no, I got to get my job done. I got to get my job done. And it takes, you know, a little bit of lean is a very dangerous thing because if you lean out one part of the organization, you're going to fail. You have to have the entire organization leaned out. But when you say, I want to pull the product through, you're not making inventory. What does that mean? So I, you know, we're, we're a step in the process, and I'm the step above you, right? I'm not making – you need one unit at a time. You can only work on one widget at a time, right? So I'm not going to make 10 units and have them staying at your station. That's what we typically do. We're like, I only care about my little section, right? So I only care about my little section, so I'm going to make as much as I can, and you're going to wait. And they're going to be waiting at your session, and you're always going to be going. Well, guess what? That's 10 items we're paying for right now, right? So I'm going to make my item, and I'm going to wait till you pull it from me. And then I'm going to pull another one from the up, cha- up the supply chain, right? So that's the pull of the product. Uh, how do you, you know, if you're, if you're a little going, huh, Google this, but there's a lot of stuff. Well, I'm thinking in terms of, because I'm, like I said, from Detroit, so I'm, I'm thinking about manufacturing sort of right down the line. Right. And, and no, this does work in a line. But it's, you know, because, okay, let's do manufacturing, right? Detroit, we, they make automobiles. Cars, right? So you make 100 cars, and they're all blue, right? Because you're just pushing them out. That's a push system. I come to you, I go, I want a black car. 
I got a hundred black cars. You got a hundred blue cars. Oh, that's cool. I want a, I want a black car. No, 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 no. I can sell you a, a blue car. See how I got a hundred of them? Don't care. I want a black one. So I'm going to go down the street, right? Mm-hmm. So it's the ability to adapt to what the customer wants, right? And that's the key because you've got a hundred blue cars. Guess what you're going to do with those hundred blue cars? Well, you're going to sell the two that actually to people who want them. And then guess what? Well, it's on the books. I got to sell it at a discount at the end of the year. And the thing I love about this is that it's all data driven. Absolutely. Uh, yo, I'm a numbers nerd. I, data, data, data. What does the data say? What does the data say? Because, you know, data makes decisions, not hunches. And that's where, uh, that's one of the cool things I see. I'm going to, that's tweetable right there. <laughs> data <laughs> makes decisions, not hunches, right? And that's exactly it. Your hunch can go, hey, my spidey sense is tingling. There's something interesting over here, right? But then you go back it up with data. You could go, something's not right. Let's get to the data. And I would say, as a whole, the oil and gas industry really is starting to realize this. We are nowhere near where we should be or could be or will be, right? But as a whole, I really think the oil and gas industry is really starting to recognize that data makes us decisions and not the old wildcat or hunch way. Which and it's very much being driven by low prices. And people hate low prices, but... but it is really forcing people to look at the numbers. Absolutely, absolutely. It's no longer, you know, let's put it over here and see if we get lucky. You know, it's, it's what does the data say? What is the decisions? You know, and data makes decisions and not hunches. And, and they're exactly right. And that's why you want to pull the system. And this works for anything. Like, this isn't just manufacturing. And, and that's what a lot of people are also starting to realize, you know, from oil and so gas. So what's a non-manufacturing application of pulling? Because I, I can picture it on, a, on an assembly line. But give me an example uh, outside of that, maybe a knowledge work or something like that. Yeah, so, um, you know, one of the teaching uh, things we do is a quotes, you know, request for proposals or request for co- quotes, right? I don't do RPs. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, let's, I call you up and say, hey, give me a quote for this. And you're not calling people push and say, hey, we're going to sell you, you know, the widget 2000. Okay, so I can, I can very much, it, it's, it's very easy for me to picture that the push and the pull in terms of a manufacturing process. What about something like a knowledge work where I mean, does this apply in a sales process? We talked about email earlier. How, how, how does this apply in a non-manufacturing environment? I mean, there, there are just tons of examples. You know, trying to think a couple off the top of my head. And, you know, one of them, um, quoting from the Lean, the Lean Startup, which is another book, and I'll, I'll, we'll quote all these, but, you know, it talks about a minimum viable product, an MVP, and this is huge for the non-manufacturer environment, and, and, and it's huge, but it's, you know, just send it. You, we were talking about that earlier, right? Is it, you, you pull it through the system, so you send it, and then you get the feedback from your customers, and instead of just pushing out, you know, thousands and thousands of copies, you, you adapt, you, you have that feedback cycle, and you, you, they pull what they need. They pull their demand through. So this works with sales, and I mean, this works with sales, this works with anything really creative, like, you know, looking at, you know, CrowdSpring, I don't know if you've heard of CrowdSpring, but it's this crowdsourcing design-based environment, and it's kind of, it was kind of cool when I was looking at it, because I'd post a hand in this logo, and this is what I want it to look like, and I'd get somebody to do 15 of them, right? Well, that's a waste of energy. That's 15 <laughs> logos you just created, and I didn't want any of them. I'd have one person go, this is what I think. And he'd wait for my feedback. She'd wait for my feedback. And I'd give it my feedback. And I would pull saying, okay, I need that other iteration. And they would not waste their energy. They would not waste their time making 15 and seeing what sticks. And they, that's a waste, right? So i go, yep, this is it. I'd pull the next one, right? Give them the feedback and pull the next one, right? Generally speaking, guess who got the, the bid? Is the people who were waiting. They gave me exactly what I wanted on the customer demand. They gave me my black car. I'm thinking as well... Uh, a lot of newer companies that are launching digital companies are really maybe unwittingly using this because a lot of things launch in beta and get refined and refined and refined. I can tell you my HubSpot CRM that I use, the, the client relationship yeah. management system that I use, it came out in beta and I was one of the first people to use it and it's only gotten better and it's only gotten better from feedback that we have we the users have given them. Exactly. No, you, you're exactly right. So then take us into five then. Oh, yeah. So five is strive for perfection. So I, I say this and, uh, you know, it's understanding what the customer wants. The customer, you, the customer gives you money and you give them a product. It works, right? So we get into a non-value at a time versus value at a time and the non-value added but necessary and stuff like that. But, you know, take, take an example of a BOP, right? What does the customer want? Put it in the ocean. It works for five years. Pull it up. Recertification. Put it in the ocean. It works for five years. I'm dumb enough to believe we can make a perfect product. Are we, you know, that's what Six Sigma is actually about. It's a funny thing. You know what a Sigma is? 
No. One standard deviation away from the mean. So one sigma is one standard deviation away from the mean. Got it. Two sigma, three sigma, four sigma, five sigma, six sigma. So math is really cool, and Google this and check out Wikipedia, right? I'm going to have to do that. Nerd out. Nerd out with me, brother, right? So math is really cool, but six sigma is six standard deviations away from the mean. That means every million products you make, you can have 3.4 defects. So 3.4 defects per million opportunities, DPMO. DPMO is the number you get thrown out there with six sigma. So... Will we ever get, get to Six Sigma? Probably not, because economic factors can come into play on BOPs, right? Our money is better suited elsewhere. I had somebody go, yeah, we're never going to get to Six Sigma on welding. It's impossible. First of all, it's not impossible. We can, right? Second of all, it's probably, it's, it's improbable because business needs are going to dictate elsewhere. But, you know, when you start making the same thing over and over again, that's the point. You, you have this goal. You strive for perfection. So Six Sigma is 3.4 mil defects per million opportunities, right? And it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you don't believe you can do it, it it's going gonna, it's gonna to deviate. It's going to take away exactly. from, from the quality of your product anyway. If you don't believe that you can make something perfect, you're never going to get to that peak of that potential. Why are you here if you can't make a perfect product? Why would you not want to make a perfect product for your customer? And guess what happens when we hit Six Sigma? It, the one day we hit Six Sigma, guess what happens? We're going to seven. <laughs> you know, that, like, I, and don't catch me on the math on that one. But that's exactly what we're doing is we're striving for, for, for perfection. That's why it's the top, right? When you look at the principles of lean, striving for perfection is at the top because that's what everything we do is striving for, for pre- perfection for our customer. And that's what all these, these principles build upon. So talk about some of these books that we're going to put in the show notes. Yeah, so, uh, you know, a lot of reading. There's a lot of good stuff out there. Uh, one of the, you know, main principles that you pretty much anybody in Lean Six Sigma is going to tell you is The Goal by Eli Goldthrat. Great book. Um, jump off a rope. Read the synopsis <laughs> if you don't have time. It's actually a pretty thick book, um, but they get into theory of constraints and um, bottlenecks. So you can only have, you know how many bottlenecks you have in your entire process? In my process? Yeah. It, I know how many. It, tell me. One. Okay. You only have one. You only have one bottleneck. Am I the bottleneck? But more than likely. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't knew want to, it. I mean, I you asked it. the question. I'm what? not going to lie to you. I mean, uh, come on. It, but No, but you only have one bottleneck. Mark, Mark could have told me that. <laughs> right? But by definition of the bottleneck, it is the, the heartbeat of your, of your process, right? It is the slowest point in your process. So you elevate the bottleneck. You keep it constantly fed. Guess what happens? you develop a new bottleneck, right? <laughs> so there's always only one bottleneck. And there's a bunch of different ways on how to do that. But it's also looking at your process. So no matter what no matter what you're doing, no matter what you're creating for a customer, be it a code, be it a blog post, be it anything, it, m- making a widget, you have a process involved. And at every step in the process, in your entire thing, you only want your bottleneck running at 100% capacity. It's funny that you say that because, yeah, I'm, I'm seeing this now even in my own business where every time I think I cleared that hurdle, here's the next one and here's the next one and here's the next one. Oh, yeah, and it, but that's, that's your bottleneck. Those hurdles are your bottleneck. And you, you get into – it's another academic exercise, but you understand tack time, and, and tack time is a whole other thing. That, that's a whole podcast. And, uh, but it's, as long as your bottleneck is less than your customer demand, you're going to be okay, Right. So, you know, and you got to look at that and you got to understand the timings because, you know, you, it might not be worth your energy, money, resource, whatever you have to eliminate this bottleneck if you're still giving your customer exactly what they want, exactly when they want it. You know, one of the things I really want to point out is if you don't actually do this stuff, it doesn't mean anything. I don't, I'm not a very academic type person. I got a couple, <laughs> I actually got an undergrad degree and a couple follow ons. But I'm more hands-on. I'm more practical. And the reason why I'm able to say all the stuff that I've been able to say is because I've done it in real world. So that's really what I want to push the most. And that's what I, I, I really emphasize the most is if you don't use this stuff, you lose it, right? And when you do projects in your home, in your community, in your church, at Habitat for Humanity, at, wherever, look at what a defect is, define what a defect is, identify what's causing those defects, and, and eliminate it from ever happening. And then the most important part is that control feature is lock it down so that nobody can ever change it again. Well, as I said, I'm inspired, and I, I got to imagine that there's more than one person listening that is. If someone wanted to reach out to you and learn more about Lean and Six Sigma, where would you send them? Oh, definitely. So, uh, neilwent.com, actually, www.neilwent.com. Can you spell uh, that for me? Yeah, N E A L W E N D T.com. 
C O <laughs> but um Neil One dot com started to um really started a blog, pick that up. Um just kind of Start teaching this stuff. I'm available for the training facilitations and stuff like that. But I really am very passionate. I, I mean, I, hopefully they could tell, you guys can tell that I'm actually really passionate about Lean Six Sigma as well as the oil and gas industry. And um, I think this is something that, especially at, at $30, like, you know, I was listening to the Halliburton earnings call on m- Monday morning. Uh, and they mentioned process improvement. And, you know, this is this is the future. Like, this is what we need to do. Mm-hmm. Not only not only right now, while while prices are low, but then once prices go back up, how much how much better are your are your profits going to exactly, be? Exactly, if you keep the cost still there, you know, and it, it it it's it's all about having the right tool at the right place at the right time and it, right amount, right? You know, it, it's all about that because it, looking at it, you're a professional. No matter what you do, you're a professional blogger, you're a professional podcaster. That's right. So you're a professional podcaster, and people listening, they're professionals at what they do. If you get paid money for doing a task, you're a professional, right? So there's no reason you can't have the right tool at the right time. In in, I love teaching this. I love being on the shop floor, and I love going out there and, and challenging them. Well, where'd you get that from? That goal's impossible. We're going to do this in, in a minute and a half. Well, we do it in 20 minutes now. That's impossible. Where'd you get that from? To be honest, we pulled it out of thin air. But you know what? NASCAR can change a tire in less than two seconds. Google it. It's crazy. Two seconds. Two seconds. It, it, NASCAR can literally change a tire, four tires. In less than two seconds. Yeah, but they got all these special tools and they got a wheel that's one nut and they just zip it on there. Exactly. It's having the right tool. It's making the right tool, making the right process, having the right setup. It's taking time, taking that step back, asking why, understanding why you're doing what you're doing and what the end state needs to be in making you making your professional work environment, right? And I don't say like professional, but I mean getting the tools you need to do the job. I mean, that's all it is. Perfect, Neil. Thank you for joining us on the show. NeilWent.com. We'll list everything that we talked about in the show notes. And as I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold you hostage now that we're going to wrap <laughs> this thing up. Thank you, Definitely. Neil. Hey, right, thanks. I really appreciate it. I love the podcast. I love it. Um, anything I can do to help you guys, you guys as well as your listeners, uh, you know, you heard the passion, but NeilWent.com. Um, I'd love to nerd out and talk and grab coffee and, and just, just talk about this and really get up the principles and, and, and understand it. It, it really is important in full and gas. Thanks, Neil. Thanks for listening to this 0.5 episode of the Oil & Gas This Week podcast. Join us again next week when we will talk to James Wanjama about how his passion for oil and gas was cultivated growing up in rural Kenya with no running water or electricity until he was a teenager. It was real tough growing up because the place that we moved to, it didn't have um, any clean water, no electricity. Until then, go find some grease, guys.